Good evening. I want to start by talking about how we grew up. And as I tell you my story, I want you to think about whether yours is similar or different. So I grew up in a small town. I played outside every day in a very free-range way until the streetlights came on. I don't remember my parents actively supervising me, but I always felt safe. I knew the physical rules. I was to stay between Woodbine Court and Parkhurst Drive. I knew the social rules. Don't talk to strangers. Watch out for these guys, my little brothers. Generally, play nice with the other kids. And if I ever encountered any kind of trouble, I knew exactly where I could go, and I didn't hesitate to do that. How many of you share a similar story to that? Right? Many of you. When I was young, the only screen I had in my house was this one. And it caused hours of conflict between me and my brothers because we had only one. So I read a lot. I listened to music on one of these. And when I was 12, I got this in my room. And it opened an entirely different world of hours-long conversations with my girlfriends. We talked about school crushes. We talked about the upcoming dance. We talked about Friday's game. We talked about the rumor mill. None of it was done in a group chat, and none of it was recorded, thank goodness. And if, it was, if there was ever anything that was upsetting to me, anything that stressed me out, I divulged it all to my diary, kept in the bottom drawer of my dresser, which I'm sure my parents never looked at. My right parents? <laughs> The point of my story is that I lived in a very contained way. I lived between parameters of the schoolyard, our neighborhood, and the reach of a telephone cord. Today, youth spend equal, if not greater, amounts of time, not only in a different neighborhood, but in an entirely different world, the online world. And the biggest difference between how my kids are growing up and how I grew up is the rapid proliferation of technology that has existed, that has occurred in 30 very short years. So for the adults in the room, we view those two worlds as very separate, the online world and the real life world. But for youth, they view it as one world, their world, the only world that they've known. And I experienced this with my own kids recently. I was uh, at a park, just up the street in fact. It was a gorgeous day. And I had just in my head thought, this is perfect. We're here, no screens, no phones, no iPads. And I looked over and I saw my six-year-old kind of seemingly talking into the sky. And I heard her say, hey Siri, where's the closest washroom? And it took me a minute to realize what she was actually doing. But in fact, she thought that there was artificial intelligence just built into the, into the air. That is how integrated technology is and will be for her generation. So for those of you in this room who are under the age of 20, everything that, you, that we did offline as kids, you're doing online. Reading, listening to music, talking to your friends, playing. You're doing it all online. And because we didn't grow up that way, and because it's incongruent with virtually every aspect of how we experience childhood and adolescence, and because some of us are still intimidated by this new technology, we tend to fight it. And we start fighting it from birth. One of the top Google searches around toddlers is about screen time. I travel across the country and I talk to the media and I talk to people about technology education. And the single most common question that I get is about screen time. In fact, 50% of the arguments that are happening inside our houses between parents and kids is about screen time. And I don't think I'm outing myself as a terrible parent to tell you that my young kids have had access to at least a dozen screens since the moment they were born. How many of you have had this argument inside of your house. Yeah. Everyone. 
So as kids get older, that concern about online screen time shifts into something bigger. And that is a concern about online safety, a very legitimate concern. Online safety issues can happen to anyone, even to me. About a year ago, my then nine-year-old and I were in the car, and she was talking excitedly about a new friend she had made, someone who loved her voice and thought her singing was beautiful. And I was half listening, as we sometimes do, but I, I stopped and asked, you know, who are you talking about? And she said, oh, it's a friend that I met on TikTok. TikTok is an online application. And she said, but don't worry, it's another nine-year-old girl. I didn't even know at that moment that she was using an application where she could actually do private chatting. So this wasn't a serious incident, but it could have been. Maybe she was talking to another nine-year-old girl, but research tells us that she probably wasn't. And we've all heard about the awful, devastating impacts of an online interaction that goes wrong. So because our job as parents is to protect our kids at any cost, and because many of us have not had this experience, we tend to pull back, we tend to shut it down, to impose restrictions, right? Instead of empowering our kids with the skills that they're gonna need to know how to navigate those dangers proactively. I had the same reaction. I wanted to shut it down. But instead I took a minute, and first I went online and figured out what the heck TikTok was, because I didn't know. And for those of you who don't know, TikTok is the number one downloaded app in the App Store, surpassing Instagram, WhatsApp, Snapchat, and Messenger. So I watched a five-minute YouTube video. That's all it took to figure out the app. And then instead of doing what I know a lot of parents tend to do, which is either remove the device or remove the app or change the privacy settings, I actually sat down with her and I showed her how to change the privacy settings. And I talked to her about who that nine-year-old might have been. And I also reiterated the rule that we don't talk to people online that you don't know in real life. So that requires a lot of trust. And just as we're preparing our kids to move around without us in the big bad world, we also need to think about how we're preparing them to move around in the online space. Because new technology and new apps and the next TikTok are coming at us very, very quickly. And many of us are still weighing the cost benefit of technology on a whole. But the reality is, technology isn't going anywhere. So what I want to do is kind of flip that fear on its head. And instead, I want us to start focusing on the incredible opportunity that technology is giving to our youth today. This generation will use technology to solve the biggest world issues that we are facing, problems that we have not been able to tackle. Things like climate change, and food security, mental health issues, cyberbullying. One of the best parts of my job is I get to travel around different parts of the country talking to high school students. And uh, I had the chance a few weeks ago to meet a remarkable young woman in Toronto. Her name is Ananya. And uh, I'm going to abbreviate the story because of time, but she uh, was doing an internship at Sick Kids in, in Toronto in the genetics department. And she became aware of a problem that exists between uh, genetic researchers not having access to big enough and diverse enough data sets because of a privacy concern. So we're all concerned about privacy. We don't want to share our, our medical information. So Ananya developed a piece of software that actually allowed genetic information to be uploaded from anywhere in the world very easily. It would pay the person that shared the data. And then it took that data and anonymized it into blockchain. And so Ananya <laughs> took her passion for genetics and her coding skills, which she had taught herself in this case, and she built a piece of software that's literally changing lives called Cleverly Genome. And she has since sold that piece of software to a big biotechnology company, and she's on to her third or fourth endeavor. So my point in telling you the story about Ananya is the power that exists if we can shift away from the fear about technology 
and we can actually focus, all of us, youth and adults, on empowering the people around us to do good with technology. And that starts by being a good digital citizen. So let's talk about that. That might be a new term for, for some of you in the room. So digital citizenship essentially means contributing positively to the online spaces that we participate in. It means understanding that what you do online has consequences not only to you, but to other people. Simply put, it's just being a good person online. So I want to tell you what that looks like in action, digital citizenship. And to do that, I want to focus in on a topic that is, I think, one of the most critical issues facing youth in this country today, and that is cyberbullying. So take a minute and look down, either your right to your left, count five people. One in five of those people has experienced cyberbullying. One of you, maybe it is you, have experienced the shame and the pain and the isolation of being the target. If you're part of the LGBTQ2 plus community, that's one in three. And girls experience cyberbullying 10% more than boys. And that happens in a whole bunch of different formats. Group texts, social media comments, photos shared widely on the internet. No matter the form, the impacts are crushing. Cyberbullying is causing a dramatic and devastating spike and mental health issues for our youth. Of those that report being bullied online, 41% now say that they have an emotional, psychological, or mental health condition. One more bit of bad news before we shift back into the positive. So 85% of bullying happens in front of witnesses. So bullying is a group sport. And on the internet, that group is infinite. So think of a time that you might have witnessed someone being bullied online. A message of hate or discrimination that was directed to a friend or maybe even someone that you didn't know. You can likely think of a time. I know I see it almost on a daily basis. What did you do? Research tells us that most witnesses of bullying online turn a blind eye. And that's because they're afraid of either themselves becoming the victim of that bullying, or they're afraid to make it worse for the person that is being bullied. So in this situation, what would a good digital citizen do? First, they would report it anonymously. Every social media application has this function. Second, they would report it to an adult that they trust. And we can all think of a way to do that anonymously as well. Third, they would reach out to the person being bullied with a message of support. It's incredibly isolating to be the target, and that message goes a long way. And fourth, they would continue to look for even more ways to contribute positively to every online space that they participate in. So another factor in, in good digital citizenship is about what happens offline, what happens in classrooms and in homes. Believe it or not, that still has a significant impact. Research tells us that what youth see outside of the, er, inside of the home is what they reflect in real life or in the online space. Good digital citizenship is about respectful interactions and personal accountability, just like it is in real life. So we must continue to model those behaviors to our youth, and we have to call our leaders to task when they do not model those behaviors. Good digital citizenship must be an ongoing conversation in our homes. So what's the first thing you do when your kids come home from school? What do you, what do you ask them? Say, how was your day at school? I, mean, I do the same thing. Except now what I say is, who did you talk to online? What did you talk about? What apps did you use? Did anything concern you? So we need to be having a conversation with our kids about who, what they are doing online and with whom with as much frequency as we talk to them about what happened at school. The goal here is for us to help our kids move from being passive consumers and passive participants in the online world to being active, positive contributors to building the kind of online world that we want to see. 
And I want to close by directly addressing the youth in the room. Again, it is such a privilege for me to, to, to travel across the country talking to youth. And whether it's in an urban center like this or way up in the Arctic, there's some common messaging. We talk about technology, we talk about their future, and one thing is always the same. You all want to make the world a better place. You will eliminate the line between technological innovation and social innovation. You are incredibly socially minded and also technically savvy. And with that comes an incredible level of responsibility. So I ask you, why not be the best possible digital citizen that you could be? Why not contribute in such a positive way that you leave no more space for things like online bullying to happen? It starts with small actions. Things like speaking up when you see something that isn't right. Those small actions will change the online space. You are all poised to leverage an incredible opportunity through technology. And I can't wait to see what you do with it. Thank you.